policy and political challenges that we face and give us a vision for the future. It will be only 30 minutes and it's actually tailored toward media. So for media that are here, we will prioritize your questions and we welcome media who are on the live stream right now. My name is Kevin Appleby. I'm the Senior Director for International Migration Policy for the Center for Migration Studies. And we have a distinguished uh, panel today um, that will talk about some of these issues. Um, our first, uh, I'll introduce them all in the order they're speaking. Our first uh, speaker is Zuni Rodriguez Alvarado, who's a formerly detained mother um, from Central America. Uh, she will tell us our, her story. She'll be followed by Wendy Young, who's the president of Kids in Need of Defense that provides pro bono legal attorneys to children all over the country and advocates on their behalf in Washington and, and in New York and other places around the world. And finally, last but not least, Guillermo Chacon, who is the board chair of the New York Immigration Coalition. So first we'll start with SUNY. Hello, my name is Suni Rodriguez. I came to this country seeking refuge from Honduras with my partner and my son. La policía mató a mi madre y a mi padrastro en el 2004. Cuando yo pedí una investigación, ellos me la negaron. The police killed my mother and my stepfather in 2004. When I asked for an investigation, they ignored me. Luego, cuando yo hablé de la corrupción a la comunidad, de lo que estaba pasando, la policía me... Dentro de la policía, ahí estaban, ya estábamos marcados. Afterwards, when I spoke with my community about the truth of what had happened and the corruption within the police force, from that moment on, we were branded. En el 2014, un oficial me dijo que mi esposo y mi, y mi hijo ya estaban marcados por lo que yo había denunciado la corrupción hacia la policía de Honduras. In 2014, an official attacked me and told me that my husband and my son were branded because of my activism and what I had said about the police force in Honduras. Por lo tanto, eh, huimos de, de Honduras en el 2014 y al llegar a la frontera estadounidense pedí de marcar 911 pidiendo ayuda. In the meantime, we fled to the United States in 2014. When we arrived to the American border, we called 911 and asked for help. En vez de ayudarme los oficiales de inmigración, me separaron de mi esposo y de mi hijo y me decían que iba a ser deportado mi esposo ante mi hijo y no sabía qué hacer. When the officials stopped us, um, they told me that my husband would be deported and I did not know what to do. No pusieron en un cuarto frío en la hielera y en la perrera y no sabía que iba a pasar conmigo, conmigo. Me entró un ataque de miedo y de nervios. Um, they put us in a cold room in the icebox and in the doghouse. Um, I did not know what would happen. I had a panic attack from the fear that I was uh, experiencing. Trataron los oficiales de migración de forzarme a que firmara mi deportación y fue un trato muy injusto el que ellos me daban, este, hablándome feo. The immigration officials repeatedly asked me to sign my deportation order. They treated me very badly. It was a very uh, unjust and mean treatment. Nos llevaron a un centro de, de detención en Dillis, Texas. Pensé que la situación iba a mejorar, nos iban a tratar mejor. They sent us to a detention center in Dilly, Texas. I thought that our treatment would improve, that we would get different treatment there. En cuanto hablé con un oficial de asilo sobre lo que estaba pasando y, y pasé mi entrevista, eh, ellos tardaron en darme una respuesta. Y mi hijo estaba en, enfermando más. <coughs> I spoke with an asylum officer about what was happening in my country. Uh, they took a long time to give me an answer after I completed my asylum interview. In the meantime, my son was getting sick. 
Después de quejarme tanto con los oficiales de inmigración, me dieron una respuesta que había pasado mi entrevista. After I had complained many times to the immigration officers, they finally told me that I had passed my interview. Pero me dijeron que no podía salir del centro de detención con mi hijo, que tenía que esperar y demoramos mucho tiempo en el centro. They told me that I, although I had passed my interview, that my son and I could not leave the detention center. And we spent a lot of time in the detention center. No permitieron que mi hijo pudiera viajar, con, reunirse con su tía en Nueva Jersey. Eh, ellos me negaron la salida de mi hijo. They wouldn't allow my son to reunite with his aunt in New Jersey. They continued to deny my uh, son leaving the detention center. Yo estaba preocupada por mi esposo porque no sabía nada, no sabía si estaba vivo o muerto o qué había pasado con él. I was very worried about my husband. I didn't know what had happened to him. I didn't know if he was dead or what had happened. Los oficiales de migración me decían de que yo iba a ser deportada, que iba a ser separada de mi hijo. No sabía lo que iba a pasar conmigo y con mi hijo. The immigration officials um, continued to tell me that I would be deported and that I would be separated from my son. I did not know what would happen. Ellos siempre me decían de que yo firmara mi deportación, que, eh, que siempre iba a ser deportada para mi país, que siempre corría el mismo peligro de estando en mi país que en Estados Unidos. They continued over and over to tell me to sign my deportation order. They told me that I would return to my country and that in the U.S. it was just as dangerous as there anyway. Dentro del centro de detención, yo reporté la, lo que había pasado, mi sufrimiento de Honduras eh, con los oficiales de ICE y de los derechos humanos que llegaban de visita al centro de detención de Dilly, Texas. I would report uh, the conditions in, in the center of detention and also in Honduras to ICE officials and to the nonprofit volunteer human rights attorneys that were there. Yo empecé a darme cuenta que llegaban abogados voluntarios al centro de detención, pedí ayuda para yo reportarle lo que me estaba pasando, de que venía sufriendo de mi país y no quería regresar, y si me podían ayudar. I started to notice that there were volunteer attorneys coming to the detention center, and I told them how I suffered in my country, and I asked them if they could please help me. Y gracias a mi equipo, eh, al grupo de abogados que me pudieron ayudar a buscar mi equipo legal, gracias a ellos pude ganar mi caso, ganó mi hijo y mi esposo. Thanks to this group of lawyers, I was finally able to get help, and I won my case, and so did my son, and so did my husband. Pero no olvido lo que yo pasé en los centros de detención, el trauma que yo venía sufriendo al cruzar la frontera, I will never forget what happened in the detention center, the way I was treated, and the trauma I experienced when I crossed the border. Para nosotros ha sido un trauma eh, el haber pasado toda esta situación. Pensé que el gobierno y el grupo de eh, nos iban a ayudar a los refugiados al pedir ayuda y el sufrimiento que uno pasa. We really suffered a lot and when we arrived we thought that the government and the group would be able to help us and help refugees who were seeking uh, a safe place and we really did <coughs> suffered a lot through that process venía con la ilusión de que en este país me iban a tratar mejor que iba a ser ese que con, el, lo, con lo que yo hablaba, ellos se iban a, a dignar, a, a tenernos lástimas de lo que veníamos pasando en todo ese trayecto. When we came, we thought that they would help us, that they would uh, feel sorry, would feel empathy for all that we had suffered in our country. Y pensé de que nos iban a ayudar por ser unos refugiados, pero no, el trato que nos dieron fue muy malo. 
We thought we would receive help as refugees, but all we received was very bad treatment. Y por eso decidí demandar a los a migración y a los oficiales eh, por el tiempo que estuve presa con mi hijo cuatro meses. For that reason, I have decided to file suit against the immigration officials for the four months that I spent detained with my son. Espero que paren de violar los derechos de la de las familias inmigrantes que están detenidas y que mi voz sea escuchada. I hope that we will be able to avenge the human rights of those who were detained. Como las familias que están detenidos en los centros de detención en Pennsylvania junto con sus hijos, ellos lo están pasando muy mal. Just like the families um, that are being detained in Pennsylvania right now that are being treated badly as well. Y mientras tanto que la corte llegue a luz lo que está pasando, que ellos se den cuenta de lo que uno pasa como inmigrante, que todo, todo no, eh, que todo ellos se eh, averigüen y hagan una investigación a fondo de cómo somos, somos tratados nosotros. I hope the courts will shed light on what is going on with immigrants coming to this country and how we are treated, and I hope that they thoroughly investigate what is happening right now. Y por lo tanto nos han violado los derechos como seres humanos y por lo tanto el gobierno este debe a mi hijo y a mí que hemos sufrido eh, abusos y sufrimientos. For the most part, I hope that this country can recognize the human rights violations it has committed. It owes me and my son for what we went through, the bad treatment that we experienced. Thank you. Um, I'm Wendy Young with Kids in Need of Defense or Kind, and I'd also like to thank CMS for hosting this incredible event this morning. We've heard a lot today about the Central American crisis and how the U.S. is responding, and Kind welcomes this much-needed global focus on refugee protection as part of the U.N. General Assembly meeting this week, as well as President Obama's leader summit on, on the global refugee crisis which is happening today. However, we remain concerned that the U.S. is falling short in fulfilling its own stated commitments to refugee protection. To use a trite phrase, it's not enough to talk the talk, we also need to walk the walk. Um, this crisis continues as we speak today. In fact, by the end of today, probably another 1,200 individuals from Central America will have presented themselves at our border and asked for protection. Uh, looking at the unaccompanied children's number, which is the, the group that KIND um, is dedicated to, in 2014 we saw 68,000 unaccompanied children arrive, which was a tenfold increase over the historical norm. Last year that number dropped to 40,000, but frankly only because the U.S. government was actively supporting and funding Mexico to interdict people on the way to the United States, detain them, and turn them around summarily without consideration of their need for asylum protection. This year, the numbers are on the rise again. Uh, we're currently hovering at a 50, around 54,000 unaccompanied children in the fiscal year, which means by the end of this month, we're likely going to approach the numbers that we saw in 2014. The reasons for that are quite simple. The root causes of this migration continue unabated. The violence is rampant in the region, and, and we heard a lot about that from today's first panel. It's generally gang and narco uh, trafficking related violence that the governments in the region are either too weak or too corrupt to control. And here I'd just like to say welcome to today's world. If you look at displacement around the world, we see more and more situations where non-governmental actors, non-state actors, are the source of violence. And the abuses that people are fleeing in today's world, while they may not fit the classic perception of what a refugee is in many people's minds, in fact is, is the same kind of abuse and the same levels of abuse that, that we need to, uh, to be aware of and offer safe haven to. The U.S.'s response, again, as we've heard today, to the Central American crisis can at best be described as a mixed response. While KIND and our colleague organizations have welcomed 
the opening up of refugee resettlement opportunities in the region, both through the Central American Minor Program in country, as well as the new initiative processing people out of Costa Rica. This is serving a very, very modest few number of Central Americans. Over 9,000 individuals have applied for refugee resettlement. Um, only 300 or so have actually been physically relocated to the U.S. And people are languishing in the region, hoping and praying that they'll have that opportunity to come through that program. We have invested a modest amount of uh, international assistance in the region to address the root causes. About $750 million was appropriated by Congress on a bipartisan basis to address the root causes of migration. However, very little of that money has been released, and much of it will be focused on helping those countries uh, beef up their own border security to prevent people from coming. The U.S. has really um, used the term of deterrence throughout its addressing of this crisis, which is something, as somebody who's been working in this field for almost three decades, something I have not seen in, very, in many, many years is an administration explicitly using the word deterrence. So what have they done to deter people from coming? They've basically found the loopholes under current law. They actually, there was some talk about even curtailing protections in 2014, uh, particularly in the context of rolling back protections under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which encompasses many protections for unaccompanied children. This was one case where congressional paralysis actually helped us because those initiatives never moved. Um, so instead, the administration defaulted to looking at loopholes under current law, and that resulted in many of the policies that you've heard about this morning. Detention of families, um, fast-tracking the adjudication of Central American cases, literally requiring the first hearing for unaccompanied children to happen within 21 days of the case being filed. This was ranking children arriving alone at our borders under age 18, some as young as two or three years old, at the same level as individuals convicted of felonies and suspected of um, being a national security threat to the United States. Um, we engaged in a PR campaign in the region, telling people don't bother coming, we're just going to turn you around and send you home. We continue to fail to recognize asylum claims uh, grounded in gang violence, um, ducking behind the nuances and the intricacies of our asylum law to prevent people from accessing protection rather than gaining it. In January of 2016, the administration initiated raids and deportations against failed asylum seekers from Central America, even when those individuals were unable to access due process. Currently, for unaccompanied children, the, the legal representation rate in our immigration courts still hovers at just 50%. At the height of the crisis, it had fallen to 17%. And as the number of children arrive, as the courts continue to be backlogged, I fear that that rate of representation will drop even further. Bottom line, we have a great protection system on paper in the United States. Now it's time to implement it. There's a candidate who's running for president who loves to talk about a beautiful wall at our border. He means a physical wall. In effect, we're creating a paper wall in our territory by failing to follow through on our international obligations. As uh, Phyllis earlier indicated, the Obama administration is in its final months. It can leave a legacy of protection or it can leave a legacy of law enforcement. It's important that we not just this week encourage our global partners to step up and offer refugee protection to those coming to their borders, but we also need to step up ourselves. The Central American crisis is not over and it will not end until peace and stability is restored in the region. The United States can and should help put the Northern Triangle on that track. In the meantime, we must embrace the principles of refugee and child protection and provide safe haven to those who need it. That's what will truly bring true meaning and value to this week's meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, especially the uh, Center for Immigration Studies. I appreciate the uh, hosting this event. All the partners that are here, um, I really want to begin thanking, you know, so much uh, Elvis and Sunny, because their voices really are who we, why we are here together. And they both embody uh, the, the tragic, the human tragic that we have been dealing when we talk about Central American refugees and migrants, and especially unaccompanied child, ch ch children. 
Uh, it's very hard. I'm from El Salvador. I left El Salvador when I was 17 years old, just because the Civil War. And I saw most of my buddies from high school were killed. And it was very hard to go and pick up their bodies and then deal with the uh, funeral arrangements. Uh, it was very hard to lose my, 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 my shepherd, Monsignor Romero, in 1980. I was in their uh, funeral on March 30, and they throw grenades and, and kill many of us that were gathered to say, you know, our final uh, see you later to our, our chopper. Uh, but today, in terms of uh, policy and, and political issues, I, I know that we talk about violence uh, and we point the fingers to gangs, but it's important to look, you know, that this is the effect of years and years and decades of, of policy in the region. You know, the Civil War, I wish that we can have so many programs like Dr. Keller, right after when we closed in El Salvador in 92, programs dealing with trauma and torture and social healing. Nothing of that happened. The effects of migrations and dividing families throughout 12 years of a brutal Civil War in Guatemala, more than that, and, and the poverty in Honduras. Uh, I think all of these issues combined, it creates an endemic problem to force migration. And lately, dealing with un un unaccompanied children. Uh, I really would like to uh, call the, uh, the Obama administration to immediately stop their policy of uh, detention, uh, immediately, because it really violates the US law established by the Bush administration to provide a legal representation and due process to all these people seeking for political asylum. I truly believe that all these programs uh, that are established to deal with this uh, a humanitarian crisis need more resources and to be enhanced to be culturally relevant to provide uh, services. I think Ramon mentioned in Mexico that the people that in, in, they have in the office assigned to deal with this type of folks going through Mexico, they don't have human rights background. And it's only like, you know, very ridiculous number in terms of the, the amount of people that have been going through, through Mexico. I think it's important for all of us to join forces and call the, the Obama administration to grant temporary protected status for Guatemalans, Hondurans, and Salvadorians. Why, if we will ask nationals from the United States not to travel to that region because are extremely dangerous, we are willing to deport family and children, as many of the speakers highlight during their presentations. And, and it's, it's important, again, you know, when we talk and stigmatize gang members, uh, and somebody was talking about programs that are successful, it's those that will engage in a very non-traditional way, uh, this particular uh, a crisis situation that contribute to the violence. But I will, I will tell you one thing, you know, meanwhile everybody talk about that, the governments walk away from their responsibility to protect their citizens. The corruption is unbelievable and drug trafficking can continue. And nobody's talking about those other issues that are really enable and uh, continue built in a very unbelievable environment for those folks to be feel security but secure and of course you know the violent the social violent that are there and, and gangs are part of that is just one component that has to be addressed I really call for uh, the United States to immediately change and review their policy obviously has been wrong you have to go and talk with folks in the US and in the region new actors that will bring new ideas on how to re reframe and really invest in true development. In the US, just, you know, and you know all of this, that the detention center has been a money-making operation, and it's sad that this continue to be uh, and allowed in this country, and right now they begin to move away from that. Why? Because so many people are suing the US government. Nonsense. And finally, the Central American governments need to take responsibility, and the Central American economic elites, they really need to understand that what we're going through it's not acceptable. We need to have a new investment from, from Central Americans to Central Americans to rephrase and uh, put together a true development uh, vision that will one day uh, 
will not force their citizens to be forced to lead because of lack of opportunities and especially to, to protect their own, their, their own lives. Finally, I think detention, deportation, and torture is not a good policy to deal with refugees. We need to uh, go back to the fundamentals of humane fairness and, uh, and historical responsibilities to deal with these uh, refugees and migrant and unaccompanied crisis. Thank you so much. Okay, we, we can take some questions for anyone who wants to ask questions. We have a microphone, especially if we have journalists here. Thank you. This was a fantastic event, and uh, I'm Carolina from the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Um, here for the High Level Summit, and grateful for for this special event today. Melanie, uh, sorry, Wendy, you mentioned the numbers of people that have applied for the Central American Miners Program compared to the numbers that have been admitted. Can you talk about that? And what we're seeing in California also is the number that are being admitted are being admitted not as refugees, but as parolees, and then the long-term consequences of that, and how are we as a community going to have to prepare for them you know, to apply for reparole, apply for asylum, like what barriers you anticipate? Thank you. Thank you. Um, from our perspective, refugee resettlement is a very important initiative that should be embraced and should be part of a comprehensive solution that the administration uses to address the situation in Central America. So we welcome that they've undertaken this initiative. But, however, as you pointed out, as I remarked earlier, the numbers are low and, and resettlement traditionally has been a very slow, very cumbersome policy or uh, program. And particularly for the CAM program, the Central American Minor In-Country Refugee Processing Program, you're basically forcing children to wait in the country where they're experiencing the dangers for that process to uh, work its way through before they're allowed to move. On top of that, as you pointed out, um, what we're seeing is roughly 30% of those that are accepted through the program are, are being given refugee status and roughly 70% are being paroled. And parole basically means, yes, you can come to the United States, the, the U.S. government will permit you to do that, but you will not receive the same support and benefits that a resettled refugee would. And particularly for children who are arriving on their loan, you, uh, alone, you do not want to put them in a situation where they do not have support mechanisms to help them safely reintegrate and uh, resume their lives in safety and dignity, enjoying their ch childhood here in the United States. So we're quite concerned about those those grant rates as well. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Amy. This is Amy Shannon from Alianza Americas. Um, Guillermo, you spoke about the need for temporary protected status. I wonder if you could just talk about that as a mechanism. I know that um, all of us would really wish that everyone who deserved it and clearly they do, or to receive a refugee or asylum status in the United States. But I know many of us also have been concerned about the fact that there's so many people that if, we, if they get deported, that, that they're in such danger. And so can you speak a little bit more about that um, alternative uh, or a additional tool uh, that we may need to have in our arsenal? And also perhaps about the, um, you mentioned that there was a need for person-to-person uh, -person connections for a new kind of thinking about development in the region as an alternative, and I, I'd like to hear more about that. Thank you. Well, I, I truly believe that, you know, it, the temporary protected status is, is something that is, is the executive could grant it. I truly believe that, you know, if you look the record of the Obama administration in terms of uh, immigration, understanding that the, the Congress has been very hostile and, 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 and against everything that this administration has been trying to do in many levels, we also need to recognize that uh, the region is so unstable that this relief will, will, will not be a permanent solution, but at least will allow folks to have that peace of mind. And, and we know, based on other experience, including El Salvador, you know, a long time was granted, and, and, and other nationals, that is truly, truly bring at least a temporary solution. And I believe that, and let's see what the, uh, the outcome of the summit will, will be, but you know, just a declaration don't really make the difference at, at, in the U.S. And, and we will be mobilizing and asking the administration before 
they, they uh, and, you know, and it's, we're not talking about too much time, that they do something to at least to live in, in his legacy, uh, in, in particular in this region. And I think uh, Noah highlight the level of violence that this, this area has been, has been going through and facing it requires some type of, 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 of solution. And in terms, in terms of new actors, I, I truly believe that, that the administration uh, in general, I, I think, has been lacking of a very clear and defined foreign policy toward Las Americas, toward this hemisphere. And unfortunately, uh, just military training and, and sending hardware and have that approach it doesn't work. And, and I believe that uh, you, not only this administration, but the governments down there also that perpetuate you know, all type of violence and, and a very racist, you know, in, in many cases, uh, in Honduras, El Salvador, uh, in, in Guatemala, uh, it, it really requires a new conversation, a new direction to, to truly, truly uh, visualize and begin to work in a, a national consensus uh, process to reframe how you want to really build a society again where, where folks will have a choice to go and visit another country, but they will not be forced uh, uh, to migrate uh, and leave behind families or split families or lost their lives. And, and also, I truly want to, uh, to, to, to call to the Mexican government to stop immediately the policy of deporting Central Americans without really offering the protection and, and also fulfilling international law in terms of those seeking political asylum or refuge, even in Mexico, that they will have the proper tools and, and, and the right uh, infrastructure to deal with that. Again, you know, it, it looked difficult a few weeks away from a presidential election in this country. I will only encourage all of us to remember that uh, elections matter, leadership matters, and, and I hope that all of us, uh, in our own way, in our own networks, will do something to respond to the miners that accompany in, in the Central American crisis that is, you know, right here in our backyards. Any other questions? Nice shirt, man. I think this should be our last Thank one. Thank you very much. Um, my name is John McCalla. I run the National Coalition for Asian Rights for quite a number of years, and I know most of you here on this panel. Um, my remark has to do with the following. I know a lot of the um, description of what's happening today to Central American refugees being held in detention and so on, harks back to at least 50 years. So the, the tools that are being used by the current administration, regardless of uh, good intentions or, 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 or policy statements, the tools that are being used by this administration are the same tools that have been used 50 years ago against the Haitians. Some even prolonged detention, massive detention policies, expedited uh, departure, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, interdiction has gone from interdiction at sea to interdiction on land, with Mexico being used as a barrier um, to to asylum seekers. So, my question to you is: I mean, despite you know, all all that is being expected of the outgoing administration. Um, can we really expect a change of policy or new tool being used by hopefully you know, a, a democratic administration in the near future? I'll just take a crack at that. And I think, Johnny, you're absolutely right. I mean, really what we're seeing being used against Central American refugees is a, uh, is a retread of what was used against Haitian refugees. And I remember working side by side with you, with Don Kerr and others in the room, trying to push that policy back around the time when the administration also changed. We had high hopes that the new Clinton administration would adopt a new policy and in fact did not to, to, um, in most ways. So here we are again, deja vu all over again. Um, but we have to remain optimistic and I think it's important through convenings like this, um, through the convenings that's happening with the General Assembly and the President's summit, that we keep pushing our leadership to do the right thing. That the approach here has to start through a protection lens, not through a law enforcement lens. That if we are going to encourage the rest of the world to protect refugees, we have to do it here at 
home on our own back doorstep. Otherwise, these words are meaningless when you're not setting a good example for the rest of the world. Quickly, quickly say thank you, brother. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, you know that that's the the, uh, the difficult situation that, that we're facing. I only hope that all of us are working because it's going to be a close election. Don't relax, and and we need to be prepared for you know the, the worst in 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 uh, well from our perspective, worse worse because the policy has not changed for many many years. But either administration, we need to go after Congress, after the, the, the new executive, and challenge them. Because, again, you know, what, what was described today in these panels about, you know, the, the, what these mothers and children go in these detention centers, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's our conscience, I think, I'm sure, it are checking in terms of, of understanding that we must go and challenge, as, as Wendy was saying, to challenge our, our leaders, and, and truly from change from detention and deportations to protection and humanitarian and historical commitment to re reframe and, and change completely the wrong way that, that refugees and asylum seekers have been treating. And again, you know, I want to say thank you also to, 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 the, uh, to the lawyers uh, and all the programs that really your representation, I think one of the speakers said that 70% do not have legal representation. And that's, that's, that's horrible, especially in this nation. But I want to say thank you on behalf of all of us to, for, for what you do and you, those that volunteer and so on, because you have been making a difference. But we, of course, have a bigger challenge if with the new upcoming administration, whoever wins. Thank you. Um, just a couple of closing thoughts before we adjourn. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is there's you know, there seems to be a finger pointing from politicians in this country that this is a Central American problem, it's a failure of governance among the Central American governments, but we have to look at our own responsibility here. Um, what, what, what country is the market for the drugs, for the drug cartels? The guns that the gangs use, do they have made in the USA on them? The gangs that started, where did they start? In Central America or in East LA? These are all issues that we don't talk about. We blame the Central American governments, we blame the migrants, uh, we blame whoever we can, but we have to look, take a hard look at our own responsibility to this region, not to mention our foreign policy toward the region over the last 30 years. So that's a conversation that needs to be had. And we're, we're at a crossroads because the numbers went down in 2015, the deterrent strategy seemed to be working, but it's not working now. Families, the number of families coming this year will probably exceed 2014. So deterrence has failed and we need to shift. And the president can do things. We commend him on his summit today, his commitment to refugees around the world, but we want him to do the same thing with refugees coming in our own backyard. And he can do several things before he leaves office. He can end family detention tomorrow. He could end it this afternoon if he wanted to by announcing it at the UN. You could give TPS to northern tri triangle country, uh, northern countries in the northern triangle. He could help Mexican government expand and strengthen their asylum protection systems. He could help increase funding toward human rights and human development programs in Central America. Um, there are several things in, that he can do, and he can discourage the Mexican government from returning people until they get screened and are, have access to due process. These are things that we can do, not to mention strengthening our own due process protections, including attorneys. So there's a lot of things that he can start the ball rolling on, and he can do with the uh, swipe of his pen. So we have a letter in the back that includes all these things. I hope you look at it. If you want to sign on, you can email us at cms at cmsny.org, and we'll send it off uh, next week. I'll end with this analogy, which many of the advocates have used, um, and which I'm borrowing, but the deterrent strategy that our government has been pursuing is akin to firemen showing up at a burning house and locking the doors. Now we have some of the elements in place where the firemen should show up and start rescuing people, and we need to do that before the house burns down. Um, and I think now is the time to do it. So thank you all for coming. And thank you for the, our participants and SUNY, thank you so much. And uh, I hope you all have a nice day.